great. Well, so good to be with you all today. Um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about is um, taking steps towards your purpose because I'm the most unlikely person to take those steps. So first thing I'd like to start with is I'd like you to take a moment, and if you have a pen and paper or phone, I want you to think about has there ever been a moment that you've had an encounter that like hit your guts, <coughs> that inspired you that you you either encountered a problem a situation and you were like oh my gosh like I can't unknow this this impacted me so deeply that I I feel like I need to do something about it um, now that could be anything from a business idea to I want to change cancer something that's happened in your life that impacted you and it gave you a dream. It gave you something that you're like, I have to do something. So take just a few moments. So I work with teenagers, so I'm going to make you interact. <laughs> so take out your phone or something, and I want you to just take 15 seconds to write it down. This could be something you think is crazy pie in the sky, totally not realistic. Um, but ne nevertheless, it's a dream. Great. You can keep writing if you haven't finished. Uh, one of the reasons I think it's really important to write down your dream is because often we have experiences or encounters that impact us. And we have thoughts where God created us as beings that are always problem solving, that are compassionate, that um, are um, innovative, right? We're in a very innovative space. But sometimes we quickly dismiss that because it's like, well, who am I? Like, I have no idea, like, even where to start, like that feels too big. Um, and so writing it down actually makes it a little more real, even if it feels like it's too big. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story in hopes to encourage you um, in something that doesn't make sense for the person with the dream to actually um, move forward in that area. So the thing that impacted me um, greatly was when I was a correction officer, age 22, right out of college. So at the time, I think my hair was almost to my knees, <laughs> and I looked very much like an unlikely uh, correction officer. I worked with um, young men that were incarcerated due to gang violence, um, predominantly ages 13 to 18, and it was when I started hearing their stories and hearing, you know, when you hear a 16-year-old that doesn't believe that they're going to live to see their 18th birthday because they haven't really seen much of that, and so their expectation is to not actually have dreams because if most of the people they know around them die due to gun violence before 18, why would I dream? Um, and as we would have these conversations, um, if they did think they'd live past 18, then they expected to be in prison. And that impacted me in such a profound way of they should be thinking about sports and prom and um, doing things that teenagers should be dreaming about and a future and a family and, um, and not that all their life meant was either prison or death. And so that, that really um, hit me. So I started praying and asking God for an answer. I said, okay, very funny. <laughs> uh, you're gonna break my heart and open my eyes for something that is so huge, like mass, mass incarceration in this country and um, the amount of young people or kids that we lock up in this country that have had so much trauma. Um, I come from Arizona with pet chickens and pigs. <laughs> so um, that was Pet Rose, and um, you could see I'm like squishing my chicken. So I'm like, God, how in the world are you going to break my heart for something that I'm the least likely to know how to impact or make a difference? Um, and I was always known as Little Teresa and her big ideas, and so had would have dreams, but doing something about them is a whole different story. So. I started doing a lot of listening and asking the young um, inmates that I was working with, what do you feel like you would need to, to break out of this? Because I heard a lot of hopelessness. I heard a lot of um, not seeing anything different. Um, but what I did hear was they said, well, a job would, would help, but we have a record and it's really hard to get legal employment. So of course, you're gonna do what you know how to do to make money to survive. The second thing was um, family and community. So the gangs really offer, you know, as opposed to giving these judgment calls of, oh, that's so bad because it's a gang. Well, what are they offering? We as human beings choose um, what feels like the best option. We're survivors, um, and so gangs have your back. They're providing economic security. <laughs> They're providing a sense of family and community that's really powerful. 
And the other thing is purpose. When you are part of a gang that's respe respected, you have, feel a sense of purpose. So I started thinking, well, what if we could be competitive with that? Because again, if we're going to choose things based on the best options we have, um, then we need to be competitive with what the street is offering these young people if we really want them to be able to choose differently. So we, I started thinking, okay, well, how can we, if nobody's going to hire um, our young people that have a record, then how do we provide a job? How do we provide a sense of family that is not going to land them in jail and, and a purpose? So that um, prayer that I started asking God, give me a vision, um, started to kind of come to fruition of a 1920s style speakeasy supper club where um, the youth are running all aspects of it. Uh, the youth are the hosts, the servers, um, the, the entertainment, the chefs, they run all aspects. So I think it's better to hear from them than from me. So I'm just gonna show a short video. I'm Leonard Ferguson. I don't know who I am yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. But before, I was, I used to be called a monster, like, because I never cared about nobody. I didn't love nobody. I hated everybody that was in my path. I used to be in a gang. Um, I sold lots of different drugs. I've done drugs. I used to rob people and just do all around bad things. Like when you don't, when you grow up in a war zone, like people think, I mean, just the watching on TV, it's way different than you being living in it. And seeing guns, seeing people get chopped off, like just a slice of meat. When when I would watch my mom and dad fight, um, and it just get so crazy where you know they're throwing dishes, he's taking out knives and stuff. I mean, I know I cried because when you get scared as a child, you cry. But, the, but at the same time, I was just like, oh, this is how life is. He said he started drug dealing when he was three. And I was like, how do you start drug dealing at three? And he says, well, my dad was the big drug dealer in the town, and he would give me this bag of something and say, take it down to the neighbor's house. So if your earliest memories are your dad teaching you to be a good soldier, uh, I don't know if I have the words, but it's like instead of like a, a dad that's a carpenter giving tools and teaching him how to do it, they've not only not given tools, but they've, um, by the abuse and by the neglect, they've um, also stripped them and, and they have holes. You're constantly grabbing for anything to fill those holes of pain. Never been happy in my, in my whole life, never. I've been mad my whole life. Never been happy, not one time. That's why I always drink and always smoke to take away the pain, but it always come back, so I just get another bottle and drink some more. I feel like the heart of it started when I was a correction officer working with boys that were in gangs. You know, we watched the revolving door, they get out, they come back, and, and I just thought, you know, there's got to be, this is horrible. So I would be looking really tough, right, in my combat fatigues and combat boots during the day and military commands, gentlemen, you know, <laughs> attention. And, uh, and then I would cry on the way home. In the middle of the night, I would literally wake up and I would just see it and it would be, okay, so the kids are running it. So there'd be, there'd be the business aspect if they wanted to learn that or cooking or serving or hosting or performing. Here's 10 different things that you can find what your niche is and will mentor you as an apprentice and you could just fly. I'm glad I met Teresa. Like she changed my whole life. She uh she told me how to be a better man and how to be a better person. First of all, that's my mother. You know, without old school, it won't, it won't, it won't be it will be a hard time right now, trust me. To be honest, half of us probably be in jail right now. That's why I like coming here. It just makes me feel better about my life. It gives me hope. Because if I wasn't here, I'd have no hope. <laughs> all, the stuff, all the stuff I did in my past, I can't change it, but I can fix it. I can change for the better. We don't want to be labeled with our mistakes for the rest of our life. That's not who we are. Old school providing a place that like pulls, pulls all that down and pulls back all those labels and says, you're safe here. We see the gold in you, and we want other people to see the gold in you, because that's who you really are. I enjoy being in the kitchen, because I love, I love being with the family in the kitchen. So, so I'm in my own world, I just, I can control everything. Just giving me 
the opportunity to feel useful, like there's somewhere I can help or somewhere I can grow and be a better person, whether it's me doing poetry, singing, or even just being a manager. I get to find myself, like find out who I really want to be. So she's been washing and she's been scrubbing since daylight, but even after that, still she don't feel right. Been skipping meals, she was too disgusted to work up an appetite. And half the night she spent dreading the sound of her name being called. Answer when he calls your name. Her mother would always say, home should have been her base. Home should have been where she felt most safe, but instead, every minute now he'll be coming. And I look at her and I tell her, run. Running, don't you look back, you just keep on running. Left, 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 right, left, 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 right, left. Exhausted as she takes every step. Do not fall back, soldier. But he calls for her name. Sir. Yes, sir. Who? um... It's just really humbling, I think, to get a chance to be a small part of believing in some of these young people and giving them a chance at life. But I so feel like it's them, you know? Like, I'm just so, like, like my heart feels like it wants to explode when I see them really push past to get to have old school, to get to have a real place so when I see somebody's really desperate, I can say, come on over. You know, we'll, we have a job for you. But it's a real life-changing opportunities to be able to offer that and to not feel helpless when, when tragic things are happening. That is like, <sighs> we? We are old school. Come on, people, come visit. We're looking for you guys. just do if I can't. Um, uh, I have one of our alumna is here, Miss Tiffany Fuller. So she's going to join me. I know we just got a little time, so I'll go through this really quickly to let you know, is it working? Yes. 76% um, is the um, average of um, people that go back to jail after they get out, and we're, we are 10%. Um, got some stats about $200,000 a year spending on incarceration and judicial costs versus $20,000 um, to go through Old School Cafe. And the ROI you can see from $200,000 is this young person we did the study comparing was not graduated, had the felony reoffending versus graduating, going to college, getting scholarships, who our young people are meant to be. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> so, I know we only have a few minutes, and we encourage you to join the, mo the movement. Um, and there's ways that you can get involved, from corporate sponsorship to dining with us. We uh, have private event opportunities. Um, uh, if you share our story today, we have a free appetizer um, coupon if you post anything on social media. Um, and so that's pretty much, and, um, and donating. We do corporate matching. So I'm going to leave this up there, and we only have a little bit of time. Um, but if you have any questions, we have Tiffany here, and she came in at 16 and now has her master's from USC. See and is more educated than I am. <laughs> so, the best person to hear from is somebody that it was one of the youth founders of our program. So, any questions for Miss Tiffany? That was awesome, Tiffany. Right? Yeah. Tiffany, uh, so what did you study? In, you, you just got your master's, right? USC. Yes. Um, well, my uh, BFA was in creative writing and communications, and I got my master's in screenwriting from USC. Wow. And how does your experience with old school, do you draw inspiration from it? I'm sure you do, but how does it impact like your daily life, getting through school and just the awesome things you're doing now? When I came to old school, when I met Teresa, I had just found my biological father, and I was hiding it from my mom, and I felt really lost, and I was depressed and suicidal, and I was looking for a community. And old school at that time was just Teresa. It wasn't a restaurant. It was just a mentoring program. Um, but now, having gone through all that, I just I know the importance of having community, and I just want to be who I had, which is Teresa or a mentor or a mentee. Like having those relationships were really important. So. Day to day, I just remember 
that I wasn't always a strong person. Like I had to have support. So remembering that and, and being able to call Teresa at 2 a.m., you know, that is um, what keeps me going, knowing that I have community and support, even if I didn't have it from my mother and my father. Thank you, Kwame. Wow. Yeah. And I think I read the monitor wrong. Do we still have it's off by four, minutes. four minutes? Okay, yeah. so any questions for Tiffany or I? I think it's always more interesting to hear from one of our youth founders who is now coming back to mentor some of our youth, so it's very fun. Um, what kind of things are you wanting to create with your degree? So the genre that I specialize in, I would say, is dysfunctional family drama. <laughs> like Arrested Development kind of It's thing. very specific and we all can relate to it. And like, I just wanna, my purpose to be a writer is to um, share it so that people who have gone through the same things that I go through, they can heal from it. You know, maybe you can't articulate your story, but you can heal from it by hearing from other people. And I think it's just my responsibility to tell my story. Is there anything that you're working on right now? <laughs> Actually, yes. Um, I well, I I'm revising a feature. It's called Brother Bob, the Flower Man, and it's about a young girl who is being rejected by her mom and her aunt that's raising her, and she uh, meets the neighborhood florist, Brother Bob, and she later finds out that it's actually her biological father. Cool. Yes, and that's the girl is me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also work in the mental health space here in Santa Clara County with youth and teenagers. And my question for both of you is, um, do you see this model can, say, expand to San Jose area or other area or maybe a different theme? You know, what, what are your thoughts? Have, or do you, have you been thinking about that or collaborating with other counties in kind of making that develop? Um, yes, I'm so glad you asked. So the big, you know, the girl with the chicken, the big dream is that we, I want to see before I die that we close prisons for our children around this nation and that we have more of old schools all around. So that is the big dream. So, uh, yeah, so we're working really hard right now on really fine tuning. It's a very hard model because it is running a full restaurant, which is really hard. Well, jazz supper club restaurants with live jazz entertainment, um, with um, working with youth that have a lot of trauma um, and intersecting those together. And we do life skills and coaching. So trying to find how to do that mix is is a little challenge, right? Um, but yes, we are we're working with a few different um, cities that are like kind of coming after us constantly saying, are you ready? Are you ready? Um, so we're working this year to try to see how can we replicate that and help other cities take it and run with it. Thank let's, you. let's connect. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful story. Um, we worked with uh, juveniles uh, uh, before. The problem we see is it's very hard to get them jobs already, but it's very hard for them to keep their jobs. What happened is their work ethics is quite different. Usually we find them they're not reliable, and sometimes they don't come to work, and they don't report. And very often, employers cannot live with that, and that's why they terminate them. So I, you are an employer as well. How do you overcome that? Yeah, so um, that's what's baked in, and that's, I think, the, the uniqueness of the model is that, so they, they all get a life coach every week, and we do life skills, and um, it's all set up. So we have sort of a um, step one, you're suspended for a couple days. Step two, you're suspended for a week. Step three, it's a month, um, versus just being fired the first time. And each time, probably worse than the suspension is the talk <laughs> that they have to have, right? So we sit down and we talk about, you know, what happened and how do you come back from that and how do you, re you know? And so the idea is that the biggest and the best learning times are often during those discipline meetings, but we always want to help them. How do you back out of a corner? Because many of them have not witnessed, they've not had um, a lot of pouring into them about how do you show up on time? How do you, when you're feeling all kinds of anxiety, not just say, screw it, right? Um, and and so that takes time to heal that, to role model that, to teach them another way with incentives. They get paid well, right? So when you mess with their money, they're a lot more willing to listen. So and, and with the heart to not just fire them immediately, but knowing it's training. So it's not easy, but that's what. So the idea is by the time they leave our program, they'll be much more employable and they've learned those skills. 